Hey there, welcome to the Everyday Marksman, the podcast where it's all about tactical skills for living a more adventurous life. I'm your host, Matt Robertson, and I got a long and good episode for you today because I'm once again talking to my friend, John Simpson. So if you are new to the show, let me give you some setup on this one because John was the very first guest I ever interviewed, uh, and I've interviewed him two more times since then, including this episode. And recently, he has a new book on the shelves, The Foundations of Patrol Rifle Marksmanship, which he thought was right up my alley and everything we do here at the Everyday Marksman. And so, of course, I took the chance to, to read it, and now we're going to talk about it. Now, this episode is not entirely about the book. We do reference things that are in it, and you can find all of that on the show notes at everydaymarksman.co. But really, the meat of this episode is about the marksmanship and training philosophies that go around you know, not just police patrol rifles, but everybody who's prepared citizen who owns a rifle and wants to learn how to do these things and wants the right mindset. So I'm not going to waste any more of your time. We got about an hour of interview to get through, so I'm going to jump right to it. But if you are pressed for time, you can jump to the end, the last 10 minutes or so, and I'll give you my key takeaways and some big notes for me going forward into the future. All right, let's get to the interview. All right, John Simpson, welcome back to the Everyday Marksman. Always good to be back. I feel like, you know, that we have an ongoing trend here of you were like the first guest I ever interviewed. And then every time we talk, I learn more. And I'm like, that's refining the entire direction I'm going down with my philosophy for myself and how I train and do things. <laughs> well, good. I mean, that's, you know, that that's kind of what it's all about. You know, I never accepted this, this whole philosophy that you hear you hear it in marksmanship and, and sniping. My my last assignment in the Army, 10th Special Forces Group Sniper Committee, and um, I had a boss there, and he was just like, um, there, there's a hundred ways to do everything, and none of them are wrong. And I was just like, well, can't believe that, uh, you know, you're in the business of jumping out of airplanes, okay? Because for a lot of things, and especially in, you know, my field of endeavor, there's, you know, there's more ways to do something wrong than there are to do it right. You know, there, there, there's a, cor- there's a correct way to look at this stuff and there's an incorrect way. The first Simpsons law I came up with was if I can't show you the math, it's just my opinion. And basically the corollary to that is, is if I can't show you the evidence, it's just my opinion. So just, mm-hmm. uh, the, the final thought on this years ago, I was, I was working as a contract instructor uh, for this police sniper school. And uh, there was a couple of state troopers that were going through and I was talking about wound ballistics. I was telling these guys what I'd learned from doc, you know, from Dr. Martin Fackler and uh, these guys, well, you know, well, we always do the thing. And uh, I was like, well, yeah, but, but that's, but that's wrong, okay? I know I know you're not used to instructors that are going, well, that's wrong because you know, everybody is trained to do this mealy mouth. Well, you know, yeah, but that's not the answer I was looking for. And one of the things I've always insisted on is I have to live in a world where, well, if somebody gives you a wrong answer, you're not doing them or the people that they serve any favors, by constantly going, well, yeah, you know, but I was looking for this. It's, hey, you know what? There's a right way and there's a wrong way to do this stuff. If you take away nothing else from me, then you're, you're constantly searching for the right way instead of like, oh, well, you know, this guy told me this and, you know, he's, he's won these championships or, uh, you know, hey, this guy was in special forces. And that's why I always tell people, I said, look, just because I retired out of SF, don't listen to me because of that. Listen to me because what I say makes sense and that I can prove to you the science behind what I'm saying. And as, as long as you approach the job that way, then you're, you're going to succeed. I feel like it was you who said this and I've I've picked it up and and kind of thought about it because I actually don't see this, this thought very often, which is judge an idea on its merits, not by its pedigree. Yeah. You know, that's always stood out to me because especially in the shooting world, it's like the total opposite. It's like, unless somebody is a grandmaster or a, not just SF, but they have to be like CAG or Delta, well, then their opinion doesn't count. And it's like, but 
is that true? Or what if actually is a good idea? And you just needed, you wanted vetting by somebody else? Like, I don't yeah. know, you know, judge it by its merits. Speaking of Delta, you can read it in Charlie Beckwith's memoirs when he was standing up Delta. And it was like, well, you know, who's the best snipers at the time? And it's like, you know, it's the Secret Service counter snipers. So, uh, you know, we're going to liaise with the Secret Service counter snipers because they're these thousand yard marksmen. They're the best shooters on earth. And we're going to learn from them. And to be the best, you got to beat the best. And the thing is, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, you could categorize these as, as thousand yard marksmen. But the biggest thing is, in the entire history of the counter sniper program, they've never had to do this against a, a non cooperative target. You know, a, a, as Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. <laughs> and it's like, you know what? That makes a lot of sense because mm -hmm. you see it all the time at um, at uh, the annual Sniper Week co competition where the new guys show up and you can tell what agencies have been laying in the prone with sandbags and squeezing off rounds and you know doing everything they can to shoot quarters uh, you know and everything else. We've had uh, two 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 man teams show up from the same agency, and their biggest concern was who's going to be first and who's going to be second. And then they both wind up fighting for last place. And it was a case of you have no idea how how good or bad you are until you like put it out there in the street and you're trying to shoot a, a non cooperative target, or you're doing things under stress, or you're shooting against somebody else, and that's where you find out where you are in the world. And I actually address that in the in the new book. Oh yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk about. It. I've got it. of course I've got it right here in front of me. But but um, I, there's something I want to pull that thread a little bit right there. Something you just mentioned because it ties to, to we were having a short conversation before the recording started. But this idea of following what the pros do. So it's no surprise to my audience that cost and time being what it is, I've been spending a whole lot more time looking at fitness things than I have on the shooting side of things. But one of the things I keep seeing is this idea that everybody wants to learn from like the world-class best bodybuilders and, and pro athletes. But at the same time, if that's not where you are at in your own career, maybe that's not the right program you should follow. Maybe you'd be better off scaling back to what is a good enough to get to build that solid foundation for yourself. And then you go practice those techniques that really make that diff that last 2% difference between winning and losing at sniper week versus I'm random dude who showed up and just barely zeroed my rifle. Like what foundations really should you be focusing on? Where should you spend most of your time? So I guess I'll open that question there. A lot of what you write is, and you, we've talked about these before, a lot of what you've, you've kind of put out there is, for law enforcement officers who the only thing you guarantee is ever qualified with a pistol. There's no guarantee that they've ever been handed a rifle and had to shoot it before. Um, so, so where do you think they start? Like, what's the first thing you should learn how to do before you say, I'm going to go compete in three gun? The, the very the very first thing is to find out what your dominant eye is because so many people overlook that. Make sure you're not shooting with cross dominance. Make sure you're good at unsupported positions before you spend all your time in supported positions. And then make sure that you're, you're working towards getting faster in rapid fire than you are getting slower in slow fire. So to, to pull a quote out of, out of the book here, you said it's, uh, let me, let me write, write it my notes. Uh, more important to develop fundamentals at 50 than prone from a bipod at 100. So I want to ask a couple, like, tell me about that. Tell me about how, where that comes from. I, I got two examples for that. Both of uh, one from one from a, a long time ago and another one that just happened at sniper week. So uh, <laughs> I was working as a contract instructor. There was this ammo company they wanted a sniper school. And um, I kind of burned my bridges there because I basically expressed my displeasure with the uh, the life choices that the police snipers had made. So um, when I teach the rifle maintenance, what I usually do is, uh, or what I did was, okay, who here cleaned their rifle just before they came? And then I'd bring it up to the class and I would demonstrate cleaning. And I never stopped enjoying the looks on everybody's faces 
when I started pulling filthy patches out of that thing from a clean rifle. You know, because they were doing it wrong. I mean, they, you know, they, they were doing what they'd been taught and they'd been taught wrong. Going back to what I said at the beginning, this is another one of these things. Well, you know, there's no wrong way to clean a rifle. Well, yeah, there are. It was so severe that these guys' rifles hadn't been cleaned correctly. Their agencies had just let out a pretty expensive contract to get every rifle rebarreled. And I told them, I said, yeah, basically all you had to do was just clean these. The bullets are hardly touching the rifling now, so you really don't need new barrels. But what, what really upset me was this one guy was telling me that he'd just come from a, a state-funded workshop on shooting a 1,000 yards, and I just lost it. The idea the fate of the free world depends on him being able to shoot somebody at two-thirds of a mile. He doesn't even know how to clean his rifle. And when I explained this to him, it was like, you know, I was, I was never asked back because I, you know, I, I hurt their feelings. Uh, the one that happened just last month. So I was one of the speakers at Sniper Week this year. I started doing a deep dive on the uh, American Sniper Association's Sniper Utilization Survey. And there was stuff in there like, you know, I was able to conclusively prove that police sniping is a 24-hour job. And it reinforced what I was always saying about unsupported positions and everything else. I said, look here, when you look at the data, which goes from like, 1975 to 2023, we can basically determine due diligence for police snipers is routinely trained to 200 yards. And if local environment and resources permit to train at 300 yards, and there was this kid that piped up in the class and it was like, well, what if, you know, I knew I was in trouble when he started with what if. Well, you know, what if you're doing Overwatch on a meth lab and the entry guys, you know, and it's 500 yards. And the guy's talking about, like, he does this on a weekly basis, right? Well, I could have asked him. It's like, so how is it that the entry mugs are within 500 yards, but you got to be back there? You know, the, the two-day conference is before the two-day range challenge. So I kept an eye on when this guy shot during the challenge, and he came through the range that I was helping to run, which was at 50 yards. And it was like, it was a 50 yard hostage situation. And the thing is, it's like, I'm looking at this guy's target and I made sure to take a picture of it because it was like, yeah, if you're shooting like this at 50 yards, you don't really need to be talking smack about what if you're shooting at 500 yards. And that's all a case of foundation. You go into the abstract where people start what ifing and everything else. It turns more into a um, uh, an ego measuring thing. I usually hate sports analogies, but it's like instead of paying your dues with the blocking and tackling drills, hitting the dummies and everything else, it's like everybody wants to start running plays. And it's the same thing with shooters. Instead of standing there at 50 yards, unsupported, shooting at a target, producing a group that's like the size of a number 10 wash tub, they would much rather get down into prone bipod with a sandbag under the toe of the stock, which I absolutely hate, and then shooting at 100 yards, taking like a minute per shot, going, hey, look at the group I fired. I'm going to cut this one out. I'm going to stick it in my wallet. If you want to get good at this, you define the target and you work backwards from that to design your training. If you don't define the target, then it's a case of, you're developing a capability and hoping that you'll run into a circumstance that capability will be able to meet. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Very much. I feel like I do this all the time in my head. Getting back to the sniper side of things, everybody is programmed to give this answer of one minute of angle. You know, hey, what, what kind of ammo should I bring to the course? Oh, capable of grouping one minute of angle. What kind of rifle should I have? Well, it's got a group a minute of angle. What kind of... What do I, what's my standard as a sniper? Oh, one minute of angle. And the thing is, it's like, well, in, in firearm statistics 101, ammo dispersion, going through a rifle with dispersion, being fired by a shooter that brings his own dispersion, just they, they add to each other without getting into the math of, you know, adding variances and everything else. Nobody's ever actually thought about that. 
Next time you're looking around, especially online or standards for schools or people are talking about ammo and they're like, oh, yeah, it's got a group a minute of angle. How many rounds are in that group? Without going into statistical theory, I think everybody would agree that three rounds that can fit into a one-inch circle at 100 yards isn't as impressive as 20 rounds fitting into a one-inch circle at 100 yards. Not even close. N- not even close. You know, if you fire more rounds, you're right, your group is going to get bigger. So the, f- the very fact that people aren't saying how many rounds are in this minute of angle standard. And then a lot of people are just like, well, you know, it's got to average a minute of angle. Well, you, you really don't know how averages work. Let's just say that you have a, you know, you don't want to use a standard door on your clubhouse. So what you do is measure the heights of all the members of the club. Let's just say there's 10 guys. Add all the heights together and divide by 10, and you come up with the average height, and you set the door to the clubhouse at the average height. Would anybody be surprised to find out that as the club members are walking in and out of the clubhouse, approximately half of them are hitting their head on the top of the door? That's what average means. So if you're averaging a minute of angle, you're still going to have rounds falling outside of that minute of angle circle. So I'm curious, uh, before I ask some more questions here, but just because you brought you, you brought up this topic, um, you know, in your mind, what should be a, a good accuracy standard target for the whole system, ammunition, rifle, and shooter? You know, I, unfortunately, I got to go with the weasel word of it depends. See, when you, once you define the target in the sniper book, target definition we have there can be approximated as a four-inch diameter circle. That's four minutes of angle at at 100 yards. 200 yards, now it's a two-minute of angle, you know. Problem with defining targets in terms of minute of angle is is that the farther away it gets, the bigger it gets. Mm -hmm. So So the farther away it gets, the easier it gets. So to to, to circle back, what you're saying is goes back to you to define the target is like if you needed to find the target is six inches at at any range up to practical, then that's the furthest. Correct. What's the furthest practical range you're ever going to use six inches? That's not your standard all the way in. Well, I mean, well, the furthest red, the further, the furthest range is what you, you know, it, it's what you're going to become comfortable with. Right. So, you okay. But, but so, so going back to our previous discussion of train fire, mm-hmm. the very first, one of the very first things that they did is they came up with a list of, okay, Think of it in terms of a uh, of a court case. Prosecution and the defense, they sit down, and before they go to court, it's like, okay, these are the facts we're stipulating to. And what they did in train fire was, is they came up with a whole laundry list of, all right, going into this, these are the facts that we're going to stipulate to when we design this program. One of the things that they did was, is, okay, so because of smoke and terrain and soldiers doing soldierly things, even though they didn't say that, the farthest you can likely expect to hit a target is at 300 meters. So they're going, all right, everything is going to be designed around 300 meters and in. And then, you know, if you want to come up with an advanced program, then that can be 300 meters and out. But we're not going to go back to the, you know, the sites on the M1906 Springfield with a site setting on there for 2,600 yards Mm -hmm. because everybody thinks it's cool. Yeah. It's funny. I know it's every time we talk about train fire that comes up that 300 and it's how off that that 300 meters or 300 yards is just such a recurring theme throughout all of the research and, and actual small arms usage. Um, So now I want to get back to the book. So the book actually is foundations of, patrol rifle marksmanship as opposed to sniper marksmanship before. Yes. Um, so I guess the question I want to ask is, you know, what was the impetus for this one? Because I know you, you, you're kind of associated with the sniper marksmanship, the sniper's notebook. Why patrol yep. rifle? So, um, as you know, the, the original sniper book, uh, it started out life in one form as uh, Paladin Press, and they went out of business. The, the rights devolved to me. And um, I was looking to get it back into print, and I found a company called Loose Leaf Law. They weren't interested in doing a reprint 
they wanted to do a fresh version of the book, which I was all for. So we did that. And then a little bit down the line, it was like, hey, do you want to do a, uh, a revised and expanded edition of the Sniper book? And it was like, yeah, great. I mean, so, you know, and, you know, you've, you've seen the stuff that, that's in there. Um, that, that and fixing a whole bunch of typos I didn't know were in there. But um, so then uh, Loose Leaf Wall was purchased by uh, Blue 360 Media, and they, they wanted to continue publishing my book. So we, we came up with that revised edition and, you know, doing very well. So uh, their law, the Blue 360, the head of uh, law enforcement, you know, business development, a uh, guy by the name of Joe Bucco, he and I were talking and he was like, hey, you know, there's a lot more cops that are carrying patrol rifles than sniper rifles because um, could you like go through this and, you know, change the word sniper to patrol and, you know, maybe, and I'm going, boy, you know, that that's a really good idea, you know, but it was one of these deals where sketching an idea out on the back of a napkin at lunch is one thing, putting it into practice is entirely, entirely different thing. And you'll, you'll see if you, if you, if you look through the books side by side, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of stuff that was able to carry over, but I had to come up with a whole bunch of new material because the patrol rifle is just so much different than the sniper rifle. It's for a different audience. It's for a different purpose. And I mean, Joe had a brilliant idea, but it was one of these deals where I had the opportunity to like put my own training philosophy onto the subject of patrol rifle Mm -hmm. because patrol rifle is, you know, it, it, it's really hot in law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, there is, in fact, uh, the some of the best efforts are coming out of. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Jeff Feltz, no. but um, he's uh, yeah, he's up in Michigan. He has uh, um, uh, he has the um, uh, has a company called Center Mass, and he's founded the National Patrol Rifle Conference. Okay. He spent the last several years elevating the state of the art in patrol rifles. But the thing is, it's like for the vast majority of the United States, an agency gets the idea to do a patrol rifle. They're either handing it to somebody and going, here's your patrol rifle, or they're doing eight hours of training on, uh, uh, you know, and once again, like we talked about before, when an officer graduates the police, most police academies, he's the only guarantee you ha- you can be assured of is that he knows how to fire a handgun. He's checked out on a handgun. And there's, you know, in all my travels, I keep on running into police officers that they, they never handled a rifle in their lives. I started doing research on some of the the doctrine that's out there across the country. And it was just like, oh man, I mean, this book is coming none too soon because these guys have absolutely, I mean, we're talking about courses of fire for training where you go out to the flat range, they put up a target down range, you lay down in the prone, you fire like 10 or 20 rounds at it. And when you stand up, you're a patrol rifle operator. Hmm. And it was like, well, you know, there's, there's a lot better ways to do that. And, um, I was, uh, I was a light weapons guy in SF before I got into the sniper business. I was in a door kicker unit, uh, other than CAG, you know, I, I'd done tactical rifle training before and I came up with what I thought was, uh, a, a new approach to it. And then it turns out that, uh, inadvertently, even though I'd written them in reverse order, I'd actually cracked one of the I cracked one of the codes for police snipers because the biggest problem is always selecting, you know, selecting police snipers for for sniper school. And when I looked at the books, like the sections on uh, cross dominance are essentially the same. Principles of the ballistics are the same, although one is for five five six and one is for three oh eight Winchester, but when I finally had the patrol rifle book, I was like, an agency can 
train their officers that are issued patrol rifles with this book, they carry around and train and qualify for a couple of years on their gas gun patrol rifle. And then when they try out for SWAT, well, first of all, they got a leg up for whatever rifle the entry team mugs are using, but they also had the basis in rifle handling and rifle marksmanship. Now they can go into the thing where sniper team leader, all right, McGuffey, here's your, here's your copy of Foundations of Sniper Marksmanship and goes, here, read through this, you know, work on the dry fire on your own. In about a month's time, you'll join us out on the range for the live fire, and we'll run you through that. Any other questions, contact me. And then you, in a month's time, when they show up at the range, you'll find out who actually read the book and everything else. So the sniper book, you know, that was designed for, this is going to be your mar- rifle marksmanship training that you get before you go to essentially a sniper craft basic school. Mm-hmm. And then the patrol rifle book, on the other hand, that is where now an agency is going to use that book to design their own training program for all of the all of the officers that are issued a patrol rifle. When you look at what we had before train fire, we had we had essentially it was a three step process for teaching somebody how to use a rifle, teaching a soldier how to use a rifle. So the first thing that you have to learn is the mechanical operation of the rifle. And that's why I, that's why I don't cover it in the book, you know, in the, you know, cause in the book, I say, if you're reading this book, you've already decided what rifle you're going to carry. So I don't need to give you recommendations on it and you know what caliber it is. So I don't need to go, well, you know, here, you know, there's this load and this caliber and all this stuff. All I was in then, Knowing that, all I was able to focus on was the, this is the marksmanship where when you, you break down the word and it's like all we're working on here is for the individual to hit his mark with this rifle. Mm -hmm. And then once you're able to do that, then you would go into the equivalent of what was the old musketry training where it's like, now you've got the tactical application. Mm -hmm. because different agencies are going to have different policies. Different states have different approaches to the use of deadly force. I put the table in the, in the patrol rifle book where it's like, okay, so very roughly, this is what you learn in mechanical training. This is what you learn in marksmanship, this book. And then this is what you learn in tactical application. So I'm calling it that instead of musketry. (laughs) Right. And, um, you know, and the thing is, it's like, it's a great system. The, the only problem was in, in the army, it wasn't able to survive World War II because as we've discussed before, that's why for year for for decades, everybody was shooting at bullseye targets on known distance target ranges because it was all about hitting the mark. And then when you qualify on those, that's when you get your marksman sharpshooter or expert badge. And then you would go over to you know, essentially their tactical application where it was like unknown distances, indistinct targets, uh, fire control orders, everything else. And unfortunately, especially with World War II, when people needed to get thrown down range, it was a case of, okay, you got your BOA badge, you know, you're a qualified rifleman. You can get your musketry training when uh, when you get to England. The patrol rifle book is intended to be it, it comes in the middle between mechanical training based off of the operator's manual from the factory, then my book, and then the department does their tactical application training. Well, it's funny because I know one of the things you didn't really get into here, uh, which makes sense in what you said, is like configuring the rifle. Right. You know, like proper configuration. Because, and, and I know, I mean, I've followed other discussions with like law enforcement trainers, and there are, you know, some running threads about, how not to set up a sling and it's going through like even basic stuff like how to thread the sling through the attachment points correctly so they don't just slip out right you know on you so it goes back to the weapon retention side of it so but i didn't really get into those which is which is fine this is the marksmanship book and on that note though i i I, what i one of the things i liked that you did and i've got to open here first off you you cited uh 
uh, Alexander Yuryev. Yes. Which I'm pretty sure the very first time we ever talked, you suggested his book to me, and I can never find it. Correct. Yeah, it's pretty much never going to find it. It was, um, yeah, it was, it, it was this book. It was, um, it was originally, it, this was uh, published in Russia, and the National Rifle Association published a English translation of this in the 1980s. And uh, as you can see, I've got a, I, I, I really haven't been keeping this one in a plastic bag. I mean, this is, um, uh, this is thoroughly read and uh, referred to. And um, it's brilliant because where we got the inspiration for the illustrations, if, if you want to show somebody how to do a, a position, you know, you don't put them in baggy clothes or a uniform or, or have all kinds of stuff hanging off of them. And it's like my partner, Russ Miller, the guy who posed for the photos, he says, hey, we ought to do a Yuryev. And you can see it's like, you know, in this page of uh, different Olympic shooters demonstrating the kneeling position, you know, all they're wearing is shorts and shoes. So there's no doubt in your mind where the elbow is contacting what part of the body and, you know, how the spine is curving and everything else. Mm-hmm. I've got a, I have a picture from an unnamed uh, military sniper manual, supposedly showing the uh, sitting position and the guy's wearing a stupid ghillie suit. So all you see is like a heap of brush with a rifle sticking out of it. You're not going to learn the sitting position from that picture. So that's why, uh, that's why Russ and I did the decision, made the decision to, as he calls it, do it, you know, going the Yuryev way. Yeah. Which, which is something I really liked out of this one. I mean, so what I, one thing I actually really liked is because you always have your historic, like you like to use like the, the 18, the 1897. Right. 18, yeah. The 1889. Yeah, yeah. So, like, like I'm looking at needling. You have the 1889 uh, diagram right next to Russ. You know, doing it was a photo in gym clothes, which you know, again, showing yes, two things. I, I that really does work as far as showing. Here's the actual contact points that you need to hit for things like elbow against the knee. That's the best depiction I've seen. Yep. But then also, hey, by the way, this hasn't changed for over a hundred years. Like, right. Like kneeling is still kneeling. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna improve it. You know, you you better you better be sure about what you're doing. Speaking of train fire, that's what happened to train fire. Basically, about five or six years worth of research went into it, and then after it was adopted, the army kept improving it until it didn't work anymore. Very army, very very <laughs> U.S. government for that matter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, no, one of the other things I thought was interesting in here, and I noted it because. Uh, and it's several years old at this point, but but the Army Marksmanship Manual, um, when it got finally got rewritten, um, included squatting, and then you have squatting in this one too. And I, it seems like there, it's nice to see it come back. I still don't see it very often, and and I think you you kind of nailed two reasons for that. But I, I want to talk about why where squatting come from. Like you know, why is that position a thing? So there aren't any 1889 drawings of the squatting position. Mm-hmm. Okay, that that's your first giveaway. Okay, <laughs> that, that's your first that's your first clue that this is like an outlier. And when I was I was doing the research for the book, and the earliest reference to the squatting position that I could find was 1916, mm-hmm. in that illustration I have in the book, where it was it started out in the the U.S. Navy in their 1916 landing party manual because they got a guy kneeling and squatting side by side. It, it, it's really a crack up because, you know, the landing party, I mean, they're wearing their, they're wearing their dress whites, you know, and their Cracker Jack hats and everything else. And all I could think of when I saw that picture was they went into the squatting position so that they wouldn't touch the, the knee of their white trousers to the ground and get it dirty. That's mere speculation on my part. The reason I address squatting is we see it taught in police sniping, but the thing is from 1975 to 2023, we actually have, we only have three incidents of shots being taken from the squatting position in the database between the sitting and the kneeling. What do you need a squatting position for? 
But it was one of these deals where I can't ignore it in hopes that it'll go away. If you look back at the sniper manual, I've got the whole how to set up a loop sling in there. I preface that with going, look, you don't need to have a loop sling. I recommend that you don't have a loop sling. However, if you are going to have a loop sling, I want you to put it on and use it correctly. Mm -hmm. So it was the same thing with the squatting position. If people want the squatting position in their tool bag, we're going to address it completely. Russ went off with a, with a rifle because there's a couple of different ways that it's been taught over the years. It was part of the course of fire in the Army of World War II going into the 50s. The Army started actively teaching it for the simple reason that we thought the next war was going to be a nuclear or biological or chemical one. And in the squatting position, unlike the kneeling, the only thing that's touching a contaminated piece of ground are the soles of your boots. You're not resting your knee on the ground or in a sitting position on the ground. To me personally, it's like uh, the go-to position is kneeling. What most people don't realize is, is that sitting position is actually a substitute for kneeling when the ground is sloping towards the target. But um, but the squatting position, it's like, okay, I, I just don't see where, why would I want to use the squatting position over the kneeling position? Well, I could I could tell you from my experience, just because I I mean I've I've practiced I've practiced it a lot when I first started doing you know learning how to shoot. I I find I'm better at squatting than I'm at kneeling because I have both elbows supported, so I'm just a bit more stable. But the two big caveats, and I think you nailed one of them in there, is the first one is I mean not everybody has the knee and hip flexibility to get down their heels flat and stay there comfortably you know, for a while. Correct. But second, when you're wearing gear, especially like belt kit, you, when you, when you go down into that squat, like it gets in the way, like you have to have it where you can ride it up yeah. a little bit to almost like your belly and then move along. Whereas if you're just doing kneeling and you just drop down real quick, then it's not a problem. Correct. So I think, I think that's kind of the two things to stand out to me about it. Yep. Which is why I said, if you're going to do kneeling, then you need to be able to do it with gear and, you need to practice it all the time. In my idea of utopia, where the first thing that you do on the range, get your standing unsupported work out of the way, then the second thing that you would do is put on all of your call-out gear and shoot from the squatting position. We'll see how that goes. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a case of, look, if you can't go from standing to squatting and then stand back up again, you need to work on that. It's just like the thousand-yard shooting. You need to work on being able to get in and out of a squat first mm -hmm. in the privacy of your home before you even think of taking up range time practicing the squatting position. And that applies to kneeling too. I know, I know of at least one trainer I've taken a course from where he had a lot of issues, and this goes on the whole physical fitness route, which isn't really the topic for the day, but he had a lot of issues with students coming to class who were so accustomed to almost stand on a square range and just standing and just kind of blast targets at the berm that when they actually made them have to move and then go to like kneeling or prone, they were so inflexible that they could not safely get up right. because they would go to get up from a kneeling, but then they were waving their rifle around and flagging people with it because they just were not yeah. stable enough to do it safely. Like that's a big deal. Like you should work on that. Yeah. It's a whole package, you know? So, yeah. So that was why, that's why the squatting position is set off separately. That's why I'm like going, okay, if, if you really insist on doing this, then this is how you're going to do it. So now one of the things that I think is interesting about this is, I mean, ultimately, whether you choose to go squatting or kneeling probably has to do with, with how quickly can you make a shot from a, at least stable enough right. position. And then you actually had a, a nice in the appendix talked about the balloon, the balloon game or head to head no, yes. where you're yeah, like, uh, shoot as fast as you can make the hit. So it doesn't need to be like if you've taken 30 seconds to get that perfect shot when you could have taken five seconds to get good enough shot, you should take five seconds, not 30. And then I thought that I thought your illustration of the, the balloon game was or challenge was was actually really fitting for that. I don't know if you can tell me a little bit about, about that. Well, is that was that your idea or where did that come from? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was I actually I actually came up with that idea when I was training snipers. 
it was it was at Fort Bragg, and uh, my partner at the time, you know, we we used to kick ideas back and forth. You know, you get this realization that sniper marksmanship is actually rapid fire marksmanship, and it seems counterintuitive because when you see people shooting, you know, they're doing the whole. It's a stationary target. It's a, it's a steel or a paper or a paper target. And the thing is, we were going, well, once you latch onto the principle of non-cooperative targets, like the the four char- you know, the four characteristics of sniper targets, of rifle targets that I identified, when they're not cooperating with your efforts to shoot them, then all of a sudden, this whole thing with the slow, precise shot. That goes out the window. Once again, you know, you have a plan until somebody punches you in the face. Well, you have a plan until somebody is like trying to keep you from shooting them. Once you start looking at things that way, then you realize that, well, yeah, because even standing offhand is rapid fire marksmanship. Because when you think about it, you know, because I talk about in the first book, especially where, you know, you get the wobble area down and, you know, you have the figure eight. Well, the thing is, as the rifle is coming down into the center of the target, the center of the aiming point, the the shot needs to break at that moment. So now you're, you're getting away from the whole slow, steady squeeze and surprise trigger break. That's essentially rapid fire marksmanship. That's why in the, in a lot of the firing exercises, it's like you go from slow fire, but the goal is to get people shooting faster in rapid fire marksmanship because then then you start living in a world where it's like, okay, the shot needs to go now. And you do it without jerking the trigger, without flinching, without the decrements from it. So in uh, national match competition, rapid fire is usually 10 shots for time you got to wrap your head around the idea that you're only firing one shot out of a rapid fire group. So you're firing that single shot like it's in a rapid fire group. And then it's like, okay, so that's the trigger control. So then once you go down that path, then there's all kinds of other stuff that you, you don't need to worry about. For all the people that are teaching the slow, steady squeeze on the marksmanship, it's like, well, how do you measure progress? Do you shoot slower? Do you know somebody is better at that by shooting slower? Well, how do you know if somebody's getting better at rapid fire marksmanship? They shoot faster. How fast do you have to be? Fast enough to hit the guy before he hits you. That's where the that's where the um, the head to head exercise came in because. I was trying to get these guys out of the idea of taking a breath and let it out, line up on the target and everything else. The secret of the exercise is you go to a flat range and you have one of each color balloon tied to a piece of string anchored to the, you know, to the range floor. And then two guys come up side by side. And then after a long interval, if it's a sniper, exercise or a short interval if it's a patrol rifle exercise the command to fire is the color of a balloon so each guy has the same target and the person that wins is the one naturally that hits the target first and the first the first time you see it done especially with people that have like been trained with slow steady marksmanship i mean it's a it's a fire drill because you know, now guys are firing and like in sniper school, they, they forget to work. They forget to run the bolt. So they're now facing the bad guys with an empty rifle and the target is still there. And we have it where both guys shoot and both guys miss. And then they're just like, what do we do now? It's like, well, if it was me, I would like fire again. Okay. I mean, the threat is still there. And I tell the guys, I said, look, the way to think about this is instead of two guys aiming at the same balloon, think of it in terms of two guys, the balloon ain't there, and they just saw each other at the exact same time. 
And then all of a sudden the realization hits people where it's like, okay, yeah, I lost this and I wound up with a bullet in my head and he didn't. And it's kind of funny when you run it for snipers because everybody, and I mean everybody, starts off on the prone bipod. And then as it progresses, you start to see people coming into the sitting position because when the, when the targets are spread across the range, Guys can't move that bipod and that stupid sandbag fast enough to get onto the target. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, it's like when you're laying there for 10 minutes, because when I do it for an agency, you know, it's different for a school, you know, because you got to have turnover. When I'm doing it for an agency, guys will be laying there for like 10, 12 minutes, which is nothing compared to real life. You know, you'll... You know, you'll lay there for like two hours and not fire a shot. So, you know, these guys will, uh, you know, they're they're laying there in the pro, you know, they're they're in the prone and nothing's happening. All of a sudden, things are getting to them, and then they start to, you know, and then as it progresses, people are seeing. Well, the guy that was in the prone bipod, I mean, he consistently loses. The guy that's in the sitting position. He's able to do this without my having to tell anybody. Everybody winds up in the sitting position, which is just what they would do in real life. Mm. So then, uh, you know, and then, like I said, with the patrol rifle. So it's a case of now you can do it where, hey, start off where the guys are standing side by side. You know, throw variation into it. Once they're good at that, then it's a case of, hey, you got to walk from this cone to this cone. And sometime, some point before you get to that cone, I'm going to call out a color. Mm-hmm. Hearing it described, people are like, well, you know, how can, you know, if it's really close, it's like, trust me, I've been doing this. I've been doing this for decades now. And it's, it's extremely easy to see who won and who lost. Mm-hmm. When I was on active duty, uh, I was, I was part of this program called uh, North Star. You know, you had a bunch of spec ops guys that were going to, uh, we were conducting training for uh, local police departments. In uh, so the the SEALs were doing CQB and the 10th Special Forces Group was doing sniper training, and I was actually doing this for them at Camp Perry, Ohio. Which, um, for anybody that's not into competitive shooting, it's like I was just. I, I was just so overwhelmed to be standing at Camp Perry, Ohio. I, you know, I, I can't tell you, but I, I set up this exercise for the guys and I'll never forget the look on this one cop's face. And he came up and told me later, it's like he was, he was moving the crosshairs onto the balloon and he had it and he was just getting ready to break the shot. And all of a sudden the target disappeared in the scope because the guy next to him had shot it. And he said in that moment, he realized that if he and that guy had seen each other at the exact same time, he would be dead at that moment. Mm -hmm. Well, and you you make the point, I think it was a really, really good illustration of, let's say somebody arbitrarily picks a time standard for themselves. Like, oh, it's eight seconds. I will hit my target in eight seconds. Fantastic. That sounds great. Until the other guy is training to beat it in six. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like, People want, you know, it's like, well, you know, what should I train for? Train to beat everybody. There's no, there's no magic number for the thing. This kind of goes in answer to your question as far as defining the target. Because it's like, well, how long is the target going to be there? Like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, so, something, I, I would much rather somebody uh, say, I don't know, than to make up an answer. Mm-hmm. Because that's, that, that screwed so many people over where an instructor doesn't know something and they're like, um, uh, this, I I'm convinced that's how dope became an acronym, <laughs> which as, as, as you know, reading my stuff is, is like one of my pet peeves in this world. Oh, you've, yeah, um, I think you sent me an email one time. I published, um, a dope card I used for a competition and I, and I used all caps on it. And then you, you sent yeah. me a nice email being like, it's not an acronym, Matt. Stop that. Yeah. I still haven't fixed it by the way. It's still up. <laughs> See, but now, but now there's an app- now there's an appendix in the uh, in the patrol rifle book explaining why dope is an acronym, and why I, it's actually a bad idea. You no, know, this conversation does does make me think, and I think I'm I asked, you know, I've asked several people about this, including Russ and and a few others. But you know, it would seem to me that a big part of being good 
would be doing competition and not not straight up like high power, you know, three position, but even like with precision rifle or anything else, like you, PRS, where hey, improvise a position as quickly as you can and make your hits so you can beat the time of everybody else. Like that would seem like that'd be a big beneficial way to, to learn these skills right. um, versus I'm going to stay in prone all the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as I, as I wrote in the patrol rifle book, it's like you'll notice that in, in athletic competition, records are only made when somebody is like competing against somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> you very rarely hear about somebody that goes on the track by themselves and sets a new world record. It's always when here's this guy that's uh, coming up to it in his peripheral vision and it's like, oh, man. No, I mean, I honestly, I, I love that balloon one. I'm probably, <laughs> if, if the day ever comes, I have a hypothetical, like I'm going to draw a fun challenge on a range for a bunch of people. I'm going to do that one. I'm going to, I'm going to. I'm gonna Good. Do that one. Yeah. I so, mean, um, and, and like I said, I mean, it's, it, it's like, um, it, it's kind of, I've, I've done it in schools. Okay. I I've done it in police sniper schools and um, it, it, it's a really big eye opener, but the thing is, it's like, you know, unfortunately you've got, you know, two people doing it at a time and the rest of the class is standing around, you know, either, either applauding or, or, you know, making fun of them. Um, it, it's, it would be really great for in-service training, but, um, yeah, but yeah, cause as far as, yeah, as far as competition go, you know, cause with patrol rifle, it's like, you know, you, you, you roll it over, you know, a lot faster. I mean, it's like, okay, here, you know, stand, mm -hmm. you ready. Okay. You know, stand by and walk and then red boom. And, um, yeah, you, you could do that. You could do that at a patrol rifle school. I think so. One of the things I'd be really interested to try, and I was in my head, I was imagining how, how it might to tie this together with the other, another chapter here is movers with balloons. So like get a little RC, like oh, yeah. you know, I'm low tech. I don't have a, I don't have government backing, but little remote yeah. control cars, tie the balloon to the top of that and make that run yeah. around the range. And if you, yeah, put, because that's yeah. what I read. That's what I read. Oh man, that would be, you could do it with, um, you could do it with just three trucks, you know, three mm -hmm. trucks with three different operators. And they're moving around the range, and then it's a, oh man, that would suck that'd so be, badly. That'd be, that'd be a hype challenge. Now, 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 on the movers, I mean, one thing, I, one thing I thought was interesting you had in there was was um, rather than using full size silhouettes, go to nine inches wide. Correct. When I thought the reasoning for that was really was really, I had never come across that before. But that's yeah, everywhere you thinking again. What are you aiming at? A person yeah. turned sideways and moving is is narrower than shoulders facing you. And reality, like you said, they don't want to be shot. Yeah. They're probably moving. So aim for right. the smaller. Because it's like, well, what's the, you know, you know, as long as the person is standing, because it's like, if you go with, well, what's the smallest the person could be? I mean, they prone out. So I was looking at something that, okay, if somebody's moving, they're up on their feet. One of the characteristics of a target that I listed was dynamic, which means that people change shape. And if you don't believe that, well, I mean, that's why I have the illustrations in the book where it's like most people are 19 inches across when you're facing them. And then they're like nine inches chest to backbone when, when they're turned to the side. So instead of hoping that you're only going to be shooting somebody who's facing you, then that's where the standard comes from. So we define the target as it's nine inches wide going back to what I mentioned in the sniper book, shooting standing unsupported will help you with every other more supported position. Whereas practicing in the prone supported position won't help you in any of the lesser supported positions. Well, it's the same thing with this. If you're constantly practicing against a cut down mover target, when somebody is facing you, then you're not going to have any any difficulty yeah to do do the harder thing most of the time yeah and or then, you know as, as derek bartlett says practice what you suck at they'll hear that and it's like yes yes practice what you suck at but then when it comes time to actually doing it it's well yeah it's difficult because it sucks yeah it's not fun it's not fun to do what you're not good at it's doing the difficult things when it's just it's you and your conscience out at the range because it's one thing, you know, you're in a school environment. It's like, okay, yeah, all right, McGuffey, you know, do do ten push-ups before you shoot. That's one thing. But when it's when it's just Matt and his rifle and his range bag out at the range, and there's like no witnesses around, 
then it's a question of, okay, how good do you want to be? You can't make it any simpler than that. I had a, it, it was a very, it was a very wise man taught me many years ago. The only way that you get good at anything is if it bothers you that you're not good at it. Uh, that's good <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that down. Yeah, that no, that, yeah, that, that, that make a good coffee cup. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I get I guess kind of related to this, and this is probably getting to the end of the, end of the topics here. But I think you had a, you had a, a mention in this the difference between my notes. You know, marksmanship training what is service rifle techniques so service rifle competition and then actual rifle operations and kind of this relationship yes. between them. And I've, I've had similar conversations like this with like with Russ, uh, you know, and others, but I'm kind of curious in your take on this because my opinion, which take it for what it's worth. I'm not, I'm not an expert at anything is that that's foundational. You know, it's foundational skills. The marks to piece is like the foundation you build on, like everything else comes off of that. And then this understanding that organized competition it's a way for you to refine those raw skills against others to see who's better at the raw skill. But then the practical piece of it is kind of that this is what's really going to happen. And the better you are, the other two, the better chance you stand over here. Yeah. I mean, a lot of it has to do with what the actual objective is in service rifle competition. Back in the day, it was, it was originally to train people to hit the mark before they went on to musketry training. Mm -hmm. But what is it now? What service rifle comp what's the goal of service rifle competition now? To win service rifle. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah, you score points. The guy with the most points at the end wins. Mm -hmm. So that's the objective. So uh, there's a lot to learn from service rifle competitors. But if I was a service rifle coach and I was teaching somebody standing offhand, you basically get the position, go through the steps of your points of performance, and then you don't move your feet for the next 20 minutes while you're doing your slow fire. That's great for winning a service rifle competition. However, as far as training value goes, you get to aim for 20 rounds, you get to press the trigger for 20 rounds, get to work on your breathing for 20 rounds. But you only get to build your position and check your natural point of aim for one round, the very first one, and then you don't move. And that's why this is what we do at the, um, uh, the three day rifle workshop that I teach with Russ is when you're doing the standing offhand, you get into position, check your natural point of aim, you know, build your position from the feet up, you fire your shot. Then instead of just resting the rifle, you put the rifle down, you step back, and then step back up to the line and build your position all over again. And that way you get to do that 20 times mm -hmm. instead of just once. You know, this is this goes to, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Um, we're out of time. But what, one of the things that I really like about kind of this newer wave of competitions that are coming out, and I, I, just, I just posted, you know, after action report of doing one, whether you call them tactical biathlons or just run and gun events. But one of the things I really like about them is it, it removes some of that, that world where it's a little bit more operations oriented. Like, Hey, you have to go run half a mile, right? Your target's somewhere in the trees. I'm not telling you the distance. Uh, there's three of them. You need two hits on each one. Yeah. And you're on your clock and you have a part time, you know, at that stage one, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Then as soon as you finish stage one, run another half mile. There's any other stage. By the way, you got to carry that 50 pound sandbag now. Right. And now you've got three targets at 200 yards. Hit them however you want, but need three hits each. Like, and it's it's teaching you this very same skill of like, hey, like, right. Don't get the perfect shot. Just hit the target. Be quick. Um, and also, you're going to be tired, and you have to know how to build a position because you're not always going to be able to get a good prone the right. grass is too tall or see, that would, and, and that would be see that would be more along the lines of at the very least transitioning to tactical application because you can't teach somebody to shoot that way if you had a beginning shooter here do this it's like well no it's like 
you, you know, they, yeah. you know, it's like throwing him into the deep end of the pool and, you know, well, he'll learn to swim by the time he reaches the and end. That, and that's what I mean when I tell people too, when I talk about marksmanship is that, you know, the more time you get, you spend mastering those basics, like mastering a kneeling position, right? Pick your favorite sitting position and get really good at it because you're never going to do it that way for real. <laughs> like for real, like if you go to one of these competitions, the ground is going to be too uneven. You're never going to get a good kneeling. Like you're going to get good enough. Right. But you have you have to yeah, you have to have a point of departure. Because it's like if you have something that you can modify to the circumstances, but coming in on circumstances and going, well, gee, what am I gonna do here? It's like <laughs> you know, how am I how am I going to fit my prone bipod to this uh, to this situation? Is you know, that that's when people run into trouble. And it's funny, this is on on the on the bipod is that um so I wrote an article for a magazine fairly recently talking about um rimfire competition and one of the comments i wrote in the article was you know what are the first things you should be buying besides your rifle and, and your ammo i actually suggested getting a support bag like it's a little like little shaped sandbag get that first and get good with it before you get a bipod because my reasoning was that most of the time whether it's real life or in these competitions like you're probably not going to get to use the bipod all that much. Like the stuff you're, you're going to be improvising and shooting positions off of ladders and barriers and trucks and, and whatever. And a bipod's probably not work, but you can always use the bag. So get that first. And I, I got, I got challenged on that. Someone was like, oh, I don't get the bipod first. Like, <laughs> okay. Okay. Fine. Like, I didn't say, I didn't say don't get one. I just said, if I had to pick one to get good with first, I'm going to take the bag. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah. Um, all right, John. Uh, I am out of time. So as always, it's a pleasure talking to you. So, uh, you know, I will, of course, leave leave links to, to find the book and, and do my write-up on it. But where can people, you know, go get it or learn more about you? Um, basically, uh, it's available from the publisher, uh, Blue 360 Media. And it just uh, recently became available on Amazon. And, um, probably, you know, price is just about the same. Uh, if you're if you're a law enforcement officer and you buy it from Blue 360 Media, you can also uh, download a a, uh, a law enforcement targeted app for your phone, and um, you also have the option of uh, purchasing an electronic version. Um, the paper version is the only one that's available on Amazon. I know I I prefer hard copies. Uh, you know, just about everybody else I know prefers hard copies. So um, right now, the right now the best place to find out about me is on uh, is on LinkedIn. We could probably put the probably put the link to the account yep. there. Yep, I'll put it on. And, I'll put it in the um, show notes. But uh, but yeah. So um, thanks for having me on your podcast again. Always a always a pleasure. All right. I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did when I was having it. Uh, it was dense. There was a lot of material that we covered. And as I was listening back to it through all the editing process, uh, which happened about a month later, a month, give or toe, about after we actually recorded the whole thing, I was like, man, there's a lot here. What am I going to have as my key takeaways? It's There's a lot of material. And I, and I joked about it at the beginning of the interview when I said, every time I talk to John, I end up adjusting my entire philosophy towards training. And this one was no exception. So if I have to pick a couple key takeaways here, I'm going to start with the most important, which is defining your target. Now, philosophically, I mean this in two ways. Defining your target both means your literal target of what are you shooting at, which helps you define how you're going to train to hit that target, but also understanding your objective. What are you training for? What's the purpose of the thing that you're doing? It, has, it should have a purpose that's impactful to you. So let's start with the first one, understanding your actual physical target. I think in every time that we have talked, the topic of train fire has come up. Now, train fire as a refresher was a 1950s U.S. Army program. It took several years to, to understand what are the standards that we should train, the characteristics of infantry combat that we should train every recruit for so that they're better prepared for the real world. And this was a response to all the years of teaching marksmanship and bullseye training, hoping that then that would translate later to Tactical application training, which very often in session in World War II just didn't happen. There wasn't time for it. So the standard came around of let's let's talk about 300 yards as a silhouette. So I'm going to go ahead and say, let's define a target and parameters that we have to hit it. And our target is 300 yards. And I'm going to arbitrarily say it's a 
12 inch vital zone. Okay. Well, there you go. That's one target. Now, where I think most people go wrong and where I think John's argument was coming from, and if I'm wrong, John, I know you're going to listen to this. Let me know in the comments. But 12 inches would be at 300 yards would be about four minutes of angle. Okay. Where most people will go wrong is they'll say, all right, well, if four minutes of angle at the furthest distance is what I have to train for, then we're going to train everybody to a four minute of angle standard, which is not terrible. And it's a nice goal. We should all pursue that where possible. However, don't fixate on the idea of four minutes of angle, because what happens if that 12 inch vital zone is now at 50 yards? Is your accuracy standard now two inches? No. If, if it's at 100 yards, is it now four inches because that's four minutes of angle? No. The target is always 12 inches. So what you should be thinking about is if that target is closer, I should be training to hit faster. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm less concerned about the accuracy standard than I am about being able to hit that target at whatever distance it is up to 300 meters or 300 yards or however you want to think about it. So that's a really interesting perspective just to keep in mind about why you're thinking about the things you do. Don't get bogged down in the idea of bullseye shooting. That's a big one there. Now it gets to the idea of what are you training for? We touched on this a bit towards the end of the interview, which was the idea behind competition. You know, it's really easy to fixate on the outcome of winning a competition. And therefore, it gets easy to forget why you're doing it in the first place. There's a lot of things in life, whether it's shooting or strength training or other skills where it starts off really impactful at first because you're learning a valuable skill. You're learning how to use a radio. You're learning first aid. You're learning how to get stronger. You're practicing a skill. You're getting your marksmanship. And all these things are really impactful to you. But at a certain point, and no one can ever tell you when, you realize you might be good at something. And being good at that thing is now your metric of success. But is it actually useful to you? Is winning the game actually going to help you be a better shooter in the real world? Now, you and I hopefully never have to fire a shot in anger, but let's let's game this one out a little bit. I believe it was Russ Miller, who, who John talked about a lot in this episode um, as a training partner. And when I talked to Russ Miller, he gave a similar discussion point around precision rifle shooting, which was he wants to train to shoot his rifle competitions the same way he would do it on a sniper callout. So he sets up his gear on the mat the same way. He wears things the same way. Is that going to slow him down? Probably. You know, that's not going to help him win the match compared to somebody who is gaming it with pouches and things fixed all just in the right spot so it's easy to access it in the moment so they can reload. But that's not what he's training for. He's, he's using the competition as a way to practice for the real thing. And that's the difference. That's the mindset shift that we all have to get to. The competition is important. We should go into the competition. I'm going to talk more about this in another episode soon. But we have to remember that competition is not the goal in of itself. Getting better as a shooter so that we can serve a higher purpose of defending our family, defending our communities. That's the reason we get involved in competition. So remember that going forward. All right, now that's two points. I'm going to go two for one. Um, the third one here is, if you didn't catch it in the episode, I went nuts over John's head-to-head drill, which is involving balloons and two shooters next to each other. You're going to hear me talk about this one a lot in the future because I think this is just so cool. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful way to let people see the effects of competition in the real world. Who's, who is the better shooter? And it's not just about accuracy, but it's also about speed and you need to be fast enough to hit the target and there's no points for being more accurate if you're too slow. All right. So I know that's counter to a lot of things people say is you can't, you can't miss fast enough, but you can certainly, you can certainly be so slow to be so accurate that you don't get to take your shot at all. So, all right, that's it for me. Thanks for listening to today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Go by the website, everydaymarksman.co. You'll find today's show notes as well as all the links. Um, I got more episodes in this one as well as links to John's book. And thanks for listening. I'll catch you next time. Take care of yourself.